Mr. President, welcome. It is wonderful to be with you. Can I ask you about your commitment to democracy right here in Athens? You did give a speech, your last speech as president, about a week after President Trump won, and you talked about your faith in the, you know, the, the solidity of the democratic ideals. A lot has happened still since then, right? <laughs> That's true. Do you still feel that way? Do you feel democracy will win? I, I do believe that democracy will win if we fight for it. I, it, it democracy is not self-executing. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on the engagement of citizens uh, and an active you know, mobilization of people around uh, the belief, not just in any particular issue, but the belief in self-governance and rule of law and independent judiciary and a free press. Uh, all the civic institutions that go into making a democracy work. And uh, I think it is indisputable that a combination of forces have put enormous strains on democracy and that we've seen a backlash against uh, democratic ideals around the world. Uh, it, it's not unique to any one place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happened in Europe. It's happened in the United States. It's happened in... Uh, this part of the world, uh, you know, uh, around the Mediterranean, it's happening in Asia. Um, the, the reason I'm optimistic is because I believe, particularly as I meet young people around the world, there is still a fundamental belief in the, the dignity uh, and worth of individuals and their agency in determining what their lives are like. I think that's what young people want. Um, but it, you know, our existing democratic institutions are creaky, and we, we're going to have to reform them. So let's ask about the, the creaky or not institutions in the United States. Yeah. The spectacle of a former president being uh, federally indicted. Mm -hmm. How is the rest of the world, the democratic world, maybe even the non-democratic world, meant to interpret that indictment and indeed the fact that a federal indictee is running, is able to run for the highest office in the land, maybe even the world? Uh, it's less than ideal, right? But uh, the fact that uh, we have a former president who uh, is having to answer uh, uh, to charges brought by prosecutors does uphold the basic notion that nobody's above the law. Uh, and the allegations will now be sorted out uh, through a, a, a court process. I think I'm more concerned when it comes to the United States with the fact that not just one particular individual is you know, uh, being accused of, of uh, undermining existing laws, but that more broadly we've seen, uh, whether it's through the gerrymandering of districts, whether it's uh, you know, trying to silence critics uh, through uh, changes in legislative process, whether it's um, attempts to uh, intimidate the press, uh, a strand of anti-democratic sentiment that uh, you know we, we've seen in, in the United States. It, it's something that is right now most prominent in the, in the Republican Party, but I don't think it's um, uh, something that uh, is unique to one party. I think th there is a, a less tolerance for ideas that don't um, suit us. And it, it, sort of the habits of, of a free and open exchange of ideas and the idea that um, you know, we all agree to the rules of the game and even if the outcomes aren't always the ones we like, we still mm -hmm. abide by those rules. I think that's weakened uh, since I left office and uh, we're gonna need to strengthen them again. So I do need to ask you then a follow-up on that because what happens if Donald Trump wins again? It's said that the institutional guardrails of American democracy yeah. were strong enough to survive a one a one-term presidency. Yeah. Are they strong enough to survive if that kind of person personality wins again? I won't step. Uh, I won't speculate on the outcome of a future election. Uh, obviously, I'm a Democrat. I've got a deep uh, I mean the institutions. Interest in the outcome. It, but but I'll, I'll make a general statement, mm -hmm. which is, having been president of the United States, you need a president who takes the oath of office seriously. 
you need a president who believes not just in the uh, letter, but in the spirit of democracy. And the, the essential spirit of democracy is that as president of the United States, you are just one representative of the people in a series of co-equal branches. There are checks and balances to the system. You are subject to those checks and balances. Uh, you cannot ignore them. You cannot make your own rules. Uh, you cannot view uh, the Justice Department as your personal law firm. Uh, you cannot uh, uh, ignore uh, norms and uh, guardrails that have been put in place to assure that um, uh, your self-interest uh, isn't uh, you know, what drives these institutions, but is rather the, the interests of the, of the American people. And, and so um, if you have anybody who's occupying that office uh, who disregards that higher uh, that higher purpose, uh, then you're going to have problems. Uh, the good news is that uh, through the mechanism of voting, the American people are going to have the opportunity to reaffirm their belief in American democracy. And, and the other thing, uh, Christiana, I, you know, I, I, I do think that what happens in the United States matters around the world. And, and the thing, sometimes I'm asked, what surprised you about being president? And, and I said, you know, I knew I was going to be busy. Uh, and I knew that uh, uh, obviously uh, the United States is an extraordinarily powerful country. The idea of America, the idea of a, the possibility of a multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious, large, big, complicated country still being able to function as a democracy, that is an important idea for the world. And when it looks like America's democracy is teetering or breaking down, then I think it emboldens those who do not believe in democracy around the world, uh, and it, it worries and, and, uh, and weakens uh, democratic forces in other places. So President Biden, man who you know extremely well, yes. has made the defense of democracy the sort of centerpiece of his, of his administration. It just so happens that right now there's also not just you know, threats to democracy by dictatorships and autocrats, but also illiberal democracy as well. Yeah. He has called the president of China a dictator, and they're sticking with it. He is also hosting, as we speak, the prime minister of India, Modi, mm. who is considered autocratic or at least a liberal democrat. Mm. What is the point, I guess, or how should a president mm. engage with those kinds of leaders, either in the naming yeah. of them or in the dealing with them? It, 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 look, it's, it's complicated. Uh, the president of the United States has a lot of equities. And uh, when I was president, uh, you know, I would deal with uh, figures, in some cases who were allies, who, you know, if you, if you pressed me in private, you know, do they run uh, their governments uh, and, and their political uh, parties in, in ways that I would say are ideally democratic, I, I'd have to say no. Do you want to name but, names? But no, of course not. But you had to do business with them because they're important for national security reasons. There, there are uh, you know, a, a range of uh, economic mm -hmm. interests. You know, I had dealt with China to get the Paris Accords done. Uh, I dealt with Modi to get the Paris Accords done because I think climate change is something that transcends mm -hmm. uh, you know, any a particular momentary uh, issues. It, it, it's, a, it's a problem that humanity has got to deal with over the next several decades in a serious way. Um, I do think that it is appropriate for the President of the United States, uh, where he or she can, to uphold uh, those principles and to challenge, uh, whether behind closed doors or in public, uh, trends that are troubling. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm less concerned about labels than I'm concerned about, you know, specific practices. Uh, it, you know, I think it is important for the President of the United States to say that if uh, you have Uyghurs in China uh, who are being placed in mass camps uh, and re-educated, quote-unquote, uh, that's a problem. That, that's a challenge to all of us. Uh, 
uh, and, and we have to pay attention to it. I think it is true that if uh, um, the president meets with Prime Minister Modi, then the protection of the Muslim minority in a majority Hindu India, uh, that's something worth mentioning. Uh, because, and by the way, if, if I had a conversation with uh, Prime Minister Modi, who I know well, part of my argument would be that uh, if you do not protect the rights of ethnic minorities in India, uh, then the, there is a strong possibility India at some point uh, starts pulling apart. And, and we've seen what happens when you start getting those kinds of large internal uh, um, conflicts. So, so that would be contrary to the interests, not just of Muslim India, but also Hindu India. So I think it's important to be able to talk about these things honestly. You're never going to have a, a, things are never going to be as clean as you'd like, right. because the world is complicated.